Hi, Stephen here for The Idiot Quilter and here's another interview in my series of interviews with subscribers. Enjoy! Hello everybody, I have another interview with another very interesting person and this is somebody that may not be an unfamiliar face to you if you've ever followed Stitch TV when that was on the air. Um, I certainly did. In fact, uh, when I first got into quilting, that was one of the first uh, podcasts that I found and I was a faithful watcher of it all the time. I learned so much from it and I just love the way you and the other half uh, just chat it back and forth all the time. And it was great. I kind of miss it, you know, but I anyway, do too. <laughs> but can you tell me, so this is Lynn and Lynn, can mm -hmm. you give me your, uh, it's Reinhardt, right? Mm -hmm. yep, okay, got that. And um, where are you located? Roughly. So I live in the Atlanta, Georgia area. I live in a little suburb called Woodstock. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, we're, you. We're, hey, saw you there. <laughs> yeah, Woodstock. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we have. Yeah, go ahead. We have uh, Woodstock every day, not just one day. A year. Not just one day. It's it's forever. Woodstock yes. forever. Yeah. So my next question for you then is, how long have you been quilting? So I started quilting officially in when I was in grad school. Um. So here's the story. So I, um, and I've told this on the stitch, but so I was in grad school at Southern Illinois University studying converse, speech communication. And I, um, my aunt is a collector of experiences. So she would like go and stay at all the bed and breakfasts in Illinois, or she would she went to all the presidential libraries because it was an experience and she collected experiences. So there was a new museum opening in Paducah, Kentucky, which is about an hour away from SIU. And she was like, Hi, they're opening this new museum. They have some kind of show, some kind of quilt show. And I just want to go see it. So she was like offered to her sisters. She had three sisters. And the cousins, the older cousins, do you want to go down to this quilt show and go to this museum? And we're going to go eat at Patty's. And, and Patty's is this kind of really special restaurant in Grand Rivers, Kentucky. And it's just a neat place. If you're ever in that area, please go. You'll love it. So anyway, I was like, yeah, I want to go. And so I went to the opening of the National Quilt Museum in 1991 in Paducah, Kentucky. Okay. Walked in and I fell in love with quilts. And I realized that, you know, I was always kind of the secret artist, not really like I wouldn't ever say I was an artist because I just wouldn't, you know, I just kind of, I didn't get into the art classes because I was in band in high school and stuff. So, um, so I walked into this quilt museum and I went, oh my God, this is art. This is artwork. And you can do it on this huge grand scale. And I was just, I fell in love. And then we walked through the quilt show and there was all these people there. And I was just fascinated at all these different quilts hanging up and how beautiful they were. And, um, and I'd always kind of stopped at one of the big shopping sites, I think in before Missouri Star was ever thought of, Paducah, Kentucky had Hancocks of Paducah and it was this quilt shop that I, and they had upholstery fabric too, but they've slowly in the past years moved from upholstery more to quilt, quilting cotton kind of stuff. And they are still an online business and a really amazing, it's a family owned, you know, company that um, does quilt stuff. But that's where I fell in love. So 1991, I fell in love with quilts and started quilting. Okay, so you've been doing it for quite a while. Yeah, myself, I've only been doing it now for about five years, so uh, I've got much more to learn. So did oh, oh, I'm yeah. still learning. Like, I think I still learn every day. But yeah, like, so well, I don't think you ever stop learning because there's always no. that's what I like about quilting it keeps you going. Right. It's that yeah. creative spark that there's always something on the horizon, which we will talk about in a little bit. But did anyone in your family influence you? Did you come from quilters? 
or sewers? Well, okay. I have a few quilts that were made by my great grandmother. Um, and my great grandmother was, uh, her name was Marietta. And she was uh, named after the city Marietta in Georgia because my great great grandfather fought for the North and was injured in Marietta or in the Battle of Atlanta. And he actually um, loved the name and then named his child Mary. Well, that's really interesting. So- And now I live here and I live like 30 minutes from Marietta. <laughs> Have you always lived in that area? No, I um, was born in Kentucky, really close to Paducah, Murray, Kentucky. And then um, grew up in Southern Illinois, my parents divorced and I grew up in Southern Illinois and then Knoxville, Tennessee. So I'm like South. And then Mike and I moved here in 98. So we've been here as long as I've lived anyplace else. So I think Georgia's home now. Now, it's kind of funny that you're a Southern gal, but you don't really have a Southern accent that I can I don't. Yeah. No, I can slip into it if needed. But right. my all my college was uh, speech communication. So we did practice lots of speaking and that kind of stuff. And so, you know, you get... You get good at just trying to be bland English. Yeah. <laughs> Y'all with the rest of them and get right down there. Yeah. Honey. <laughs> yeah. Well, if I slip into the Canadian accent, eh? So, <laughs> but anyway, yeah. I love dialects. I just think they're so fascinating and they're, they're different in the South. Like there's no one Southern dialect, you know, Tennessee's different than Mississippi or Georgia or Florida. It's just okay. that fascinate me. Yeah, that's like Canadian English, too. It's more subtle, I think, the dialects, but there's definitely different dialects depending on even from province to province. So kind of like from state to state, you know. Yep. So um, exactly. I, I see you have a lovely creation behind you. Is that one of your favorite? Do you have a favorite creation? And if you do, why is it your favorite? Um, oh, My favorite is usually what I'm working on right now. Hmm. Yeah, because um, like I thought if I'm falling in love with it, I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm excited to work on it and stuff. Um, this is a Lone Star or um, a lot of before it was before before the pattern got to Texas, it was called Bethlehem Star. Um, it's been around for a long time since the 1800s. And uh, so I have got fascinated with them because I think they just show color really in a unique way and can be very vibrant. And I've made like five or six of them, um, just like playing with color and seeing how I like it and stuff like that. Um, so, but I find that like last, this year, no, it's this year, um, I got stuck on double wedding rings and I made like four double wedding rings in like, you know, a month and a half. And it was just simply because I wanted to see what else I could do with it. I wanted to see what else I could like I'm fascinated by color. So, and I think quilters have an advantage because, you know, unless you're a true modern quilter, which is just using solids, which I, I think they'd kick me out of the modern movement, even though I was president of the guild. Here for <laughs> um, I just, I love the pattern and the play of color and how we just have these really unique palettes because pattern gives it to us. And I just think it's so much more in depth than like painting, you know, cause, or, cause that, not that you don't have incredible art artistry in that, I, I, you really do, but it's not like we play with solid color just only, unless you're a modern quilter and then you see them play with only solids, right? which I like, but I, it's not my forte. I'm like all the pattern all the time. So that brings me to my next question then. What, type of quilter are you in terms of a label uh eclectic you label yourself eclectic okay right. i was going to say just from what you've just said i would call you eclectic too but you want to know something i don't think i ask that question all the time in my interview and nine times out of ten even if they don't say the the, the title i think most quilters are eclectic well, don't you just fall in love with, like, I can appreciate, and I'm a certified quilt appraiser, so I think that that plays into some of this. So I love, like, the traditional look of quilts um, and all the reproduction stuff and the people that are into reproduction stuff. 
that is, a, it's gorgeous and it's beautiful. And I can, I can appreciate it for what it is, but I, that doesn't live in my house well, because I, that's not who I am. Not to say that I don't have, you know, a little hint of that in traditional furniture or something, but I just, I love color and I love all the colors. And so I tend to be more on the brighter side of the, I mean, if you made me pick my favorite designers are like Kay Facet and Tula Pink and um, just that more of that bright kind of side thing. I know exactly what you mean. I, I'm similar to that. In fact, my very first quilt was made with Kay Facet uh, fabrics oh. and that's what got me into quilting really because I saw- Have you, have you seen him or met him in person? No, I, ha I have seen him on like different programs or that, you know, on the internet, but I've never met him in person. I've met him. He's a neat guy. Yeah, I, I would think he's probably very, very much like his fabric designs. Very bold, colorful personality. Yeah, he is. He is. And his um, his husband um, is just as fun. I got to hear him lecture here and he was just really neat there. It, if you get to go hear him, he's expensive to go listen to. Yeah. He definitely and he's worth the price. So yeah. just. You know, sometimes you can see lectures uh, fairly inexpensively, but yeah, he was he was expensive, but amazing, really amazing. So now, he's not a quilter, like he is a knitter. Yeah, I know, I know that. I found that out about him, you know. But he designs these fantastic fabrics. The use of his color, the shape, the whole bit. Yep. You know, those are I, paintings. He does yeah. paintings. And then that gets translated yeah. into fabric. And then I just think that's fabulous. I yeah, love it. I think so. So yeah. he really crosses over two worlds, doesn't he? Uh, with he does. that, you know, he's an artist, but he's also a, a quilter. But that leads me to a question I have usually asked later on. But I'm going to ask it now because we're talking about art. So you yes. mentioned um, something to the fact that you, it sounded like you kind of felt that people don't take quilters to be artists or to be artistic and um, I don't agree with that because my idea is that we are all artists because of the decisions we have to make we have to you know coordinate colors we have to pick design we have to construct it in certain way you know we may vary from a pattern or even create our own all of those things to me is somebody that's an artist the only difference is our palette is fabric so how do you feel about agree that? with you Completely agree with you. 100% agree with you. We are artists. And that I think is more prominent as becoming more recognized in our own world. To say that it's recognized in the art world is another thing because they want to put craft as a label for us. Right. Because it's a useful item, because it's a, you know, basket is craft, um, pottery is craft, quilts are craft because it's a useful item. And that is, um, and it is not considered high art, which right. I totally disagree with. And I will tell you the story. So um, Gerald Roy, who is the kind of godfather of the certified quilt world, um, he, and I think this is just beautiful. He did a, a, an exhibit with the Boston Museum of Art. And the Boston Museum kind of was always looked down on quilts as being craft or whatever. So about, I want to say it's five or six years ago now, probably longer. I'm horrible with time. He did this museum about color. And so what he did is they went in and they found all of these um, artworks that um, they hung a quilt right next to the artwork that went together because it was about color. So, and what was interesting was, um, all of the quilts that were hanging were in the 1930s or older. So none of them were like contemporary new quilts. They were all older quilts because Gerald Roy has this fabulous um, collection that and his passing will go to the Boston Museum. He's already said that. Um, but before they did this exhibit, what happened was is, and Gerald Roy told us this story. So I, I took classes from him and he told us this story. So what happened was, is when the Boston Museum approached him at doing an exhibit of quilts, he said, wait a minute, you have to come to my house first. So the curator of the museum comes to Gerald Roy's house with this huge collection to pick up what 
clothes are going to go in it. And he set him down and he handed him some fabric and he handed him a needle and thread. And he said, you need to thread the needle and you need, I'm going to show you how to piece this together. And so the, the curator of the Boston Museum learned how to pan piece together uh, pieces. And, and then Gerald said, okay, then handed him another piece of fabric and he had to learn how to do needle turn applique. <laughs> Wow. Because that's what you would have seen in these quilts is needle turn applique and hand piecing. And so once the man understood the process that you had to do to create this, then Gerald showed him the quilts. Ah, uh, good. The other thing about it that I think is totally fascinating is you had all these quilts hanging here next to these phenomenal pieces in the museum. And at the, at the artwork, we had who painted it, when they painted it, what the name of it was, and then you had the quilts. And because quilters have not recognized themselves as artists, or museums and the culture has not recognized them as artists, if you buy a quilt at an antique show or whatever, you don't know the province. You do not know who made it, when they made it, why they made it, and what its name is. That's right. Nine times out of 10, not a label on it to give credit. So here, all these people are walking through this museum, very high quality museum, and looking at these amazing paintings and quilts that are unknown. And so I'm a real big opponent. Name your quilts, data, put a label on them, because we have to be recognized as artists as who we are. Because in a hundred years, when our quilts hang up there, they're going to know that Lynn Reinhardt did that. And that's definitely a, a, a good way of explaining the importance of a quilt label. And I am guilty of not labeling. I've labeled some and others I don't. And I keep saying to myself, I need to. Okay, here's what you do. I've got your solution for you. Okay. So what you do. So take your... Because you have like a logo, right? Yeah. Right? So take your logo, go to Spoonflower or any one of these online print things and repeat that logo multiple times with a little blank space at the bottom. You could probably get, I don't know, 100 in a yard, depending on how big you get it. Right. Have them print out a yard for you, mail it to you, and then your labels are made and it's got your logo on it. And then... You can write in the name of it and the date or whatever with pin. And then your labels are consistent. They're tagged. It's just like a pottery stamp. That is a really good idea. I have dealt with spoon flour before because I have designed some of my own um, fabric as well. But uh, that is an excellent idea. I never thought of that. And yeah. and then you're it's ready. It's ready. Yeah. You get the quilt done. It's ready. The label's already there. You just cut it out and stitched on. I'm going to do that today. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah, a good idea. I love that idea. Yeah. Yeah, I do it. I, I have Cotton Art Studio labels. And, and then if you send it into a show, I mean, you can put your address on it if you want. I don't know. I, I do if I know it's going to a show, my address is on it. But um, normally it's just like whatever I named it. Maybe you leave space where you can write maybe who it's to. And right. as a quilt appraiser, I would ask you to do this. I know everyone has a mom, so don't put to mom. Oh, <laughs> yeah. But to her name. Right. Her name. Yeah. And that way, historians can go, oh, this was made by da 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 da. So. It's such a great idea. I'm definitely going to do that later today. I had not thought of that. See, I always learn something from somebody. I know. That's oh. why we talk to people, so we can learn stuff. That's right. So let's change the thought pattern here a little bit. And let's talk about your quilting environment, where you are when you quilt, what, what's your setup like? So I'm blessed. I have a finished basement that three quarters of it is mine. And so I have a studio. I'm sitting in my studio right now where I film classes and do my YouTube show from. Um, Right over there, you can't see it, but right over there is my long arm. So it's kind of behind a little half wall over here. And then I have a, this was an apartment in my basement. So there's a kitchen down here with a refrigerator and stuff, which is nice. Cause you're yeah. like, yeah, I need some water. And it's in the, it's you know, the fridge or whatever. Yeah. 
Um, and then I have a, uh, it was a bedroom with a walk-in closet. And that's kind of where I store my fabric and books and stuff. But the bedroom is where I have my embroidery machine and my, um, my regular sewing machine and cutting table and ironing board. So it's in a bedroom um, that was a closet <laughs> or that was a, you know, it was an apartment down here. My mother used to live with us before she passed. And so when she passed, I actually used her bedroom that she used and I, it's been good. It's like, oh, mom's kind of here with me. And she yeah. was all proud of me learning how to quilt and stuff. She always said to me, she goes, you before long before she passed, she was like, I think it's interesting because as a kid, you would try all the art stuff, you know, painting and, you know, drawing and this and that. She goes, but once you found quilting, you never changed. And so I think that was just kind of an interesting, like her, Take her insight into her daughter, you know, yeah. was cool. So I think it's neat that I get to quilt in her bedroom. Well, that's that's something else too. I'm kind of flip flopping here back to the whole art and craft thing. But, you know, before I became a quilter, I was a major scrapbooker, art journaling, journal making, you name it, if it was in paper crafts or whatever, have glue gun, we'll go. And I did that for years. And then when I found quilting, I went, I'm not interested in other stuff anymore. No, nope, I'm going to do quilt to the point where the room I'm sitting in now, which you can't see because I have a virtual background on, is my sewing room, but it was my craft room and it's a pretty big room. I got rid of all of my crafting supplies, except for a handful of a few. My friends that are, are crafters were absolutely thrilled because I gave it all away to them. And I'm talking, one lady came with a half ton truck and we filled it. Okay. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Out of it all. So yeah, but it was before that I had a, an area in part of my husband's workshop, which is always a mess. I called it the dungeon. Uh, now we cleaned that room out because we got a long arm and it had to go yeah. somewhere too. So that brings me to ask you about your equipment. You said you have a long arm, you have an embroidery machine, your sewing machine. So what are you using? What's your long arm? So I have an APQS. Um, yep. <laughs> Um, although I call her Clementine. Yeah. Did you so say Millie? Clementine, Mel, yeah, it's a Millie. I have brand. a Lucy. <laughs> um, but it's Clementine. So um, I bought her in 2006. So I've had her for a while. Yeah. Um, I don't quilt for other people very often. It's very rare that I quilt for other people because I only do custom quilting and I charge premium for it. Mm -hmm. I, I used to not do it because I was like, it made me nervous working for other people and making sure they like it, you know, whatever. Um, but now that's, it's like, and I used to say, I, I'm not good enough. And now I'm like, now I'm good enough. So I can't use that excuse anymore. So <laughs> I, just, I really, um, I, it's for me and I didn't buy it to quilt for others or have a business in that. That's not my. Isn't it funny when people hear that you've bought a long arm, the first thing that comes out of their mouth is, oh, are you going to quilt for other people in charge? Are you going to start a business? And I say, no, I'm not good enough. It's for me, me alone. Mm -hmm. And I bought the computer uh, system for it too. So I don't have the computer. It was too expensive for me at the time that I bought mine. Um, so I don't have the computer and I've just learned to do it on my own. And I do a lot really intricate um custom quilting so like I've got um I'll have to show you I, I don't I maybe I can send you pictures or something but like I'm working on this Alice in Wonderland um series so I've got two quilts done out of it and it's all whole cloth thread painted um yeah. so uh I've got two of those and I'm and I've already got that third one in my head I just haven't quilted it yet um so I had some I had some issues with uh, sickness earlier this year, so I haven't quilted yet um, in the last few months, which has been hard, but yeah. I have a long arm. And then I have a Bernina uh, 750, I think it is, um, which is my big sewing machine. I have a serger that's a baby lock, and I use that very rarely, only to like him tablecloths or do the pillowcases or something. Um, and the reason is, that thing, you do not want to have to thread that thing. I know what you mean. I have one too. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I have to thread it, I'm like, okay, God, please give me grace. <laughs> yeah, I know. I need patience right here. Um, 
So I have that. And then I have a baby lock elegante, which is a, my, I just have it set up to do embroidery. And I thought that I was going to be much more into embroidery than I current, than I really am. But honest to God, uh, here's what I embroider. I embroider initials on purses or bags. <laughs> Cause I'm a true Southerner. I believe you have to monogram everything <laughs> I'll do it on my napkins or I'll do it. So like, it's just like a monogram thing for me now. I mean, every once in a while, I'll get one of those. I like Kimberbell and uh, Anita Good Design. Every once in a while, I'll buy one of those and I'll make something that they, I think I did the mug rugs of one of the Kimberbell ones that for football season or something. <laughs> but, I've never tried to do a whole quilt as a, from an embroidery thing. I have. I've done several of them. I love embroidery. Oh, I do too. I love it. I just... um I know I haven't done a whole quilt. I've done, I've done some in the hoop stuff, uh, making little zipper cases yeah. or little, um, like a mug rugs. I've done the mug rugs. I did a bunch of those because I thought they were cute for um, football season. And you know, I embroider a lot of, of my name or I embroider my initials a lot. So I use my because <laughs> I'm good southerner. You have to embroider your initials so on every. So do you have a favorite tool then that you always reach for? Hmm. Maybe a hard question because we have a lot of tools. <laughs> I do. I don't know that I would, I would say I have a favorite. Um, I use that little cutter thing that cuts because I chain piece a lot. Oh, yep. The little gizmo. I use that or cutter all the time. Like I use that yeah. all the time. Um, I think a wool mat is necessary. Uh, yes, I love a wool mat. A wool mat is by far one of the most important things. I do believe if you have the space um, and you don't have like a real cutting table, like that you can buy from Horn or Arrow or wherever, right. they will sell you a cutting mat that will cover the entire table if you buy those kind of cabinets. Now, if you don't buy those kind of cabinets, you can still get a cutting mat cut to your table size. Um, and you would go like look for architecture type of mats. Right. Um, and you can get them cut to what your table is. And I think a full table cutting mat is so useful. Because yeah. you don't, I, and a lot of people um, may disagree with me, but you will have more accurate cutting if you just use the ruler and not the mat. And if you're cutting to the mat, your cutting is not gonna be as accurate than if you cut to the ruler. And um, so you don't need lines, but I, a lot of people have a hard time with that. They, they yeah, need I know. Yeah, I, 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 I've heard that before and I follow that too. I use the lines on my rulers, not the lines on my cutting mat. And I do have a full table cutting mat as well because when I because it just makes it easier oh, yeah. to move stuff around I, yeah. I just think it's a convenience that you think it's it's a convenience that you appreciate when you don't have it like when you go to a retreat or something and you're stuck with this little you know right yep the little, like your 12 inch space kind of thing. yeah it, it's it. I don't know I just feel like I need more space to cut so I used to that I used that um skewers do you use wooden skewers are you talking about for po poking out corners? No, I'm talking about in feeding while you're piecing. I have so, a stiletto that I use. Yes, but, you can use a stiletto, but if it's metal and your needle hits it, you're not going to be a happy camper. Right. I never thought of that. You use a wooden bamboo skewer that you can get at the dollar store and get a yeah. you know, hundred of them. You can just, that way, if your needle hits it, it won't hurt anything else. I mean, okay. if it bites the the bamboo stick you've got more another new thing that i just learned today so I, i'm going to try that i use this little metal stiletto but yeah you're right if you hit the needle it's game over so it's game over good. and and i'm really protective that i don't want to throw my timing out or anything like that with yeah the, yeah exactly we have expensive tools and uh, you know i want to respect to them. Look after them yeah they're an investment they're really an investment right. so um, if you had speaking of investments, if you had all the money in the world, is there a piece of equipment you would invest in? 
Um, if I had all the money, I would let's see. I would extend my my room, my space. Yeah, I think that's what a lot of. And I have a lot of space, so really, that's kind of saying a lot. I have a lot of space, but I would extend it. Yeah. Can you ever have enough space? I don't think so. You know, I've got space. I fill it. <laughs> yeah, and mine is kind of broken up. It's not like all in one area. So I think I would like it maybe all together. You know, to where the to where I can get a camera on the long arm easier or I can get a camera on my sewing machine easier. And that's really selfish for, I mean, that's really kind of a, I teach online kind of thought process than just a normal quilter who doesn't need to be on, on camera. I'm still looking for a camera that I can mount onto my, uh, I call mine Lucy. Well, she is a Lucy, uh, APQS too as well, because I've got cameras in my long arm room, but they're, they're not good enough. I need something close down, you know, to show the quilting and, and that. So mm -hmm. I'm still investigating something like that without getting into, a, you know, a, an infrastructure <laughs> to rebuild all around. Right. It, you know, yeah, thing. exactly. And but, that's, that's not something that I think the average quilter would no. need to worry about. Um, I do have a ton of space and I use it, that's for sure. But yeah, as I get more and more into this, I definitely, I would, I would build out my space. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we're always reinventing our space, too. You know, I, I'm always reorganizing, going, wait, why did I originally put that over there? It would be better if it's here closer to me. So, but, you know, I, I like doing that process, too. You know, I like oh, to, yeah. to look at and, uh, you know, to see what'll work. I, you know, not just put it down and go, that's it. And I think that's what there are quilters out there who will not deviate from a pattern. It has to be exactly that. And it has to be exactly those colors and fabrics. And that drives me mental when they do that. Well, I kind of get it. Like, I, I, know, I know a lot of quilt store owners um, and they will sell fabric because a quilt is made and hanging behind it. And they'll go, this is the fabric that makes that. Because somebody's like, that's what I want. And I get it from a very beginner quilter. I mean, if you're a beginner quilter, like I tell everybody, get a, get a kit, do a kit. Because yeah. I want you to learn how to do the basics. I'm interested that you make really good quarter inch seam. I'm interested that you're cutting well, that you're cutting accurately. I'm interested that you're pressing accurately so that you're not stretching something or that you're, you know, that you're trimming up the right way. Um, you are investing hundreds of dollars in this, in this craft, in this hobby. Yeah. And I want you to be successful and if color and pattern and design intimidate you, then let's give you a kit that you already know you're going to be look good. And you just worry about being successful in the techniques. Yeah. And once you get good at the techniques and following enough patterns, then you kind of go, hey, I want to do this. Like I'm getting ready to start it. I'm glad you kind of brought this up. I'm getting ready to start a stitch along and you're going to learn 13 blocks. And it's going to take us about six months because I'm going to do one every two weeks. But in the middle weeks um, in my program, I'm going to show you how you can change the colors and how that will affect it. I'm also going to show you like different ways to combine the blocks to where you could make a thousand different quilts with 13 blocks. Right. right. So that's kind of what and it's called Quiltlet 101. And I'm starting it in July and I'll send you the link. For it. Um, yeah, send me the link. And I do want to come back a, a little bit later on in the interview here to talk more about your actual business and your, your resources and things like that. But before we do that, I'm going to ask you about, you know, you're talking about kits and things like that. Do you have, do you like to go into a quilt store to buy most of your fabric and supplies? Or are you an online shopper like so many of us became over COVID? I became more of an online shopper over COVID, over COVID than I ever had. Um, I uh, haven't, uh, like, yes, I used to teach at some of the quilt stores, so I definitely bought fabric from them. Um, I used to go and sew at a quilt store with a bunch of friends once a week, so I definitely bought fabric from that quilt store. Uh, so many have closed here. Yeah, same here. So that's been tough. So I have, I do shop online. I, I shop at Missouri star. I shop at Hancock's at Paducah. I shop at fat quarter shop. Um, those are the 
probably the big three that I shop at. Um, I do, I watch the D-Stash stuff that people put up fabric and I'll buy from there. Um, but I, there's a difference and I'm, I'm not below buying from the big box stores. So, and I know that, but here's what I know about the big box stores because I understand fabric a little bit is the gray goods that are printed. The gray goods is the raw fabric before it's printed. So the gray goods that are used for the less expensive big box stores where you can get $6 a yard mm. compared to $12. And I'm talking American. I know yeah. Canada is different. It's a million dollars in Canada. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're what, $30 <laughs> a meter or something? It, it has been up to that. The average price rate yeah. now seems to be about $23 a meter. Yeah. And a meter for the Americans are, is only about this much bigger than yeah, the, three inches. Yep. Just, just so the Americans know it's, it's a big difference in price because ours is about $12 a yard right now. 12, 13. That's for printed. If you're looking at boutiques, that's going to be more. more. Yeah. So anyway, the gray goods that you can get at the big box stores, which one would start with a W, the other would start with a J, at least down here. Um, I don't know your big box stores. Uh, so they would, um, they're not finished as well. They're not sealed as well. So they definitely have a different texture and different feel. And sometimes they're not woven as tightly. So because they're not finished, they don't have that finishing. They don't go through all the steps. That's why it can be cheaper than the quilt store quality quilt or fabric. Um, just be, just be cautious on how you use it. You know, if you're not pre-washing the big box store fabric, definitely use color catchers the first time you wash it, you know, um, okay. just recognize that it's going to be a little bit different. You're just going to have to baby it a little more. Well, essentially, you get what I'm you pay for. Using it, I'm just saying, be careful about, you yeah. know, how to use it. Yeah, you essentially get what you pay for. I mean, yeah, you know. So, I mean, this is this is not a cheap hobby. But then again, no hobbies are cheap. You know, there's not a lot more. <laughs> no, I mean, if you think you're going to make a cheap quilt, then it will be a cheap quilt. It'll fall apart. <laughs> and you know what? <laughs> you know what I love about quilters, though, is our hearts in that. You know, because when, you know, you actually tell somebody, look, if you want a queen size quilt for me, you know, you're talking $2,000 and they're yeah. like, what? Yeah, I know. They don't understand the value. I'm like, well, 600 of that is in the fabric. And then you've got all my time and all the cost of long yeah. arm and, you know, whatever. And so they, but then we give so many away. Yes, we do. Well, you know, we have to have people that are quilt worthy, first of all. You don't want to go over, see this quilt that you've spent a long time on. You've given it to somebody and the dog has chewed on it and is like laying on it and peeing on it and munching on bones on it. There are some quilts that I'm like, when my, you know, when my niece and nephew were born, there were quilts that I made for them that I'm like, use it till they fall apart. Yeah. Like, I want them washed and babies are leaky and. Yeah. You know, but you they, know that when you've put it together, that that's how. Yeah, I do. I know that when I put it together, and I'm not doing like thirty hours in a quilting on it, and yeah. it's not, you know, yeah, it's got the meander, like you know, it's not. So I recognize all that. But when you I'm, know when you when you mention when somebody comes to you and say, "Oh, I'd love you to make me a quilt," and then you drop the price on them, and they look at you and that much. Well, yeah, because of just what you said, fabric, you know, materials, your time, everything like that. But they're non-quilters. They don't get it. They think handmade means cheap. No, it well, doesn't. and and they go to the, you know, there's a restaurant around here called Cracker Barrel. Yeah. And they sell quilts that in the store and they're, you know, $120, $130. And, I, you know, I don't even look like I'm like this. Yeah. Mike's like, don't, don't look at the price. Just walk by, just walk by. Yeah. But they're mass produced. This is so wrong. People yeah. think this is a quilt. Yeah. And I don't, I don't even consider that a quilt. Like that's not a quilt. It's not a quilt. That's a ma mass man. Those yeah. are printed. Yes. Cheater yeah. fabric. Yeah. Which by the way, here's a little fact. Cheater fabric has been happening since the 1700s. Oh, has it? 
Yeah, they've been doing Tudor fabric years for years. Wow. That makes it look like it's quilted. Yeah. So there were cheap people Looked back like in the 1700s cheap. too. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's been out for a long time. 17 or 1800s, maybe it's 1800s. Now, I would consider you an expert because of your experience, because of your teaching classes and things like that. So as an expert, do you have an expert or experts you turn to when you are looking for inspiration or for help with something? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I'll tell you where to find experts. Join a guild. And I know some of them can be tough, but um, I found some really dear friends in the guild and some people who, when I was first starting, just, they know it. They know, they just know the quick way to do that. This one lady, she's almost in her nineties too. One of my very favorite people in the whole world. And she's one of the most talented quilters I know. And I would turn to her in a heartbeat, in a heartbeat if I get stuck. And I just, you know, like, I know some professional long armors that, you know, have national awards and stuff. And so like, I'll go to them and you know, and she's in a guild that I'm in. It's an art guild. I have this really cool fiber art guild that I go to. It's a smaller group of people, but it's more art related than necessarily traditional quilting. Um, we, a lot of us have traditional quilting background, but we explore a lot of different techniques with paint and dyes and, you know, different ways to play with fabric. Um, mushroom dyeing, it's kind of cool. Uh, so anyway, I would go to this lady that's in there. She's a professional quilter and, you know, go, okay, how would you handle this? You know, and give her, pick her brain and stuff. So she's really awesome. Yeah. Well, the guilds are a great source of, of information in that I did belong to one for a while. Um, and now I belong to a couple of online groups that meet on a regular basis. And yeah. I, I got a problem. I just throw it out there and I'll get like yeah. five different answers from it that, you know, yeah. Work. And honestly, I, I'm happy to answer all of those questions if I know. Like if people go, hey, what's, how do you do this? And I'll just like, my, it's just my opinion. Like you can totally take it for what it's worth, you know? <laughs> that's the teacher in you, right? <laughs> you know? That's, that's the teacher in you. So this you want to help, right? Yeah, I want to help. And this is how I would do it. But you may find a better or more effective way for you. And that's yeah. that's awesome. Teach me that so that I have that in my my tool tool bag. Yeah, you're always free to take the advice or not take the advice is up to you, but at least there are sources for that advice. Right. You know, yeah. You're not a you're not an island out there all alone in the middle of the river no. kind of a thing. There's no. call in on the talent of other people with more experience. So we kind of covered two of my topics on here because one of my questions was about guilds or online groups and that, but you've already kind of covered that. So let's talk about your business, about your YouTube channel. First of all, let's go with your YouTube channel. What's it called? And why did you start a YouTube channel? Which I think I know the answer, but this is for other people. <laughs> um, it's called Cotton Art Studio and um, I'm on YouTube. And I started because I missed talking to people about quilting. So it was actually two years ago yesterday that we ended the stitch and we ended it for good reasons. Um, my business partner needed to spend more time with their family. And so it, it was just the right time. Um, so we ended it and then I just went back into sewing alone by myself. and then COVID started. So like, then we were locked in and, you know, although I do think my generation is made for this um, because we were Jenna, I'm Gen X. And, you know, we were the generation that kind of went, we're by ourselves. Okay. What do you need? You know, (laughs) we learned to entertain ourselves as a kid. So this wasn't a big deal for me. And my husband's the same way. We were like, all right, (laughs) we're good. Um, now I do live in a state that didn't stay locked down as long as other states did or other countries did. So I recognize that, but, um, so I just started sewing again and kind of gotten in this thing. And then, uh, beginning of this year, I was like, I really miss it. And I felt like it had been a long enough time that, you know, it wasn't just that I could do it on my own. Like there was a lot of soul searching too, of like, can you do this by yourself? Like, cause I was so used to talking to somebody about whatever, um, who's a friend and all that kind of stuff. And so 
I just kind of went, I miss it. Like, I'm just going to start talking again and I'm going to start talking online. So I'm currently doing a crayon color challenge where I pull a crayon out and then at, then I'll do a video of that crayon with different fabric color of seeing how different fabric can work together and wow, you can put that color with different colors and fabrics and stuff like that. And just kind of inspirational type of stuff. I did not know I could talk about red for 45 minutes. Like <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh. Like I, I'll do these colored things and I'll be like, oh my gosh, I've talked for that for 45 minutes. It's shocking. So I missed it. So that's why I started it. And then I was kind of playing around with the stitch along thing. So I've decided, yeah, we're going to do that. So the pattern, I've been working really hard and getting all the patterns and all that kind of stuff out. Um, it is going to have a little cost if you just want the pattern or if you want to join the group and we'll do more. But, um, you know, I need to make money. <laughs> what pla Yeah, well, what platform will that be on then? Will that be through YouTube or something else? Um, so if you just want to watch the videos of how to make the blocks, it's YouTube. If you want to buy the pattern, um, that's on a platform that I'll have a link to, but it's called, um, it's a teaching platform that'll have the, the instructions and all that kind of stuff on cutting and those kind of things. And then I'm going to add some more stuff um, in a private uh, Facebook group if people are interested in joining that, which will be more of the, and I'll send you a link to all this, but yeah. it'll be more of the, hey, here's how you can redesign this. Like, I really want to talk about kind of cracking my brain open and going, all right, this is what I think about when I'm putting these together. And I was really excited when I designed these blocks, they're 10 inch blocks. And I designed them to where they can look together, they look good together no matter how you combine them. So, um, and there was real thought process in that, so. It sounds really interesting. So yeah, definitely send me the link so I can put it into the show notes as well so other people can tap into that. Because I certainly, I want to tap into that too. Because, you know, the same, when COVID hit, I was used to taking classes at my local quilt store that all shut down. And then I discovered Zoom and like a lot of people, and I love Zoom. I absolutely love Zoom. I do a lot of things on Zoom. And, you know, and the, the advantage of doing a Zoom kind of class or even a retreat or a so day or something like that is you don't have to lug any of your equipment to another environment you've got everything at your fingertips right there you never have to re uh, think about forgetting something that you know that you don't have so yeah I think COVID really changed the the landscape when it comes to classes I, I will say to you I think this is true so when when we started the Stitch TV show we were the first online quilt talk show um, on YouTube so when we started it, like we would go to shows, we would talk to people and we were like, okay, we're, you know, an online quilt talk show, you should check us out. And they're like, what channel are you on? Hmm. My cable. And I'm like, ugh, that just, it was so hard to get, you know, our audience to understand that there was YouTube and you could watch stuff and all that kind of stuff. COVID hit, we quit. <laughs> <laughs> That's when everybody learned about YouTube. Yep, yep, it blew up. All right, okay. <laughs> um, which I was like, well, that's not good timing. <laughs> so yeah. anyway, but um, I, the part of the program that I've got, how I've got it set up is if you join and get into the private YouTube channel or not YouTube, channel, Facebook group, I will give you a link to Zoom and then we will all talk together and it'll be a class every two weeks. So, um, and I just think that that is a great way to get people so that I'm answering the right questions. Like, I don't know what goes with this. What can yeah. I do? <laughs> no. All right. Well, let's figure it out. You know? Yeah. And also I think it, why, by doing what you're talking about, the way you're going to structure it so that you, the people join, but they get the private link to the zoom that will, that you'll weed out those that aren't so serious, you know? Yeah, the right. people who really want to get into something, learn, experience yeah. it all. So, and I think that's a good thing. I really do. I want to be in there too. So, okay, I'll yeah. send you the link. It starts at the first instructions. I'm going to drop the the fabric requirements um, for the quilt. Uh, I thought about hanging it behind me, but I was like, oh, not yet. I'm not ready yet. Um, <laughs> so, um, I. I will drop the instructions on Friday, like they planned to be dropped on Friday for 
and this is just supplies if you want to make the quilt as I designed it. Right. And it's all solids. So it kind of has a modern edge to it. But I'm going to show you it in other ways, mm. at least blocks in other ways, so that you can go, I'm, you know, I may not be a solid person. So right. Well, it sounds great. Absolutely sounds Good. great. So anything else about your business model? Uh, what what you have planned is is that what you're going to do right now, or do you have other great plans for the near future with it? Um, so this the stitch along is kind of the big the big plan right now. I'll continue to do the color stuff on YouTube and and this will be on YouTube too. It just won't all be on YouTube. There will be behind the scenes stuff and Zoom links and that kind of thing. Um, so I've got other stuff kind of planned, but it's kind of more along like down the line a little bit. I'm trying to step back in slowly just because I'm doing it all by myself now. <laughs> so yeah. there's a little bit more. And there's you know, a lot of work. There's a lot of work for doing this kind of stuff. You know, yeah. People, yeah, people don't realize what goes on behind the scenes of YouTube videos or in prepping for classes and things like that. There is a lot of work. Yeah, there and really I'm, is. I'm a and, uh, school teacher, so I know. <laughs> well, and like, okay, so for a quilter, like you make the block once if you're in the class. I make it four times. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Because I have it in stages. Yeah. So step outs. Yeah. Here's how you do this. Yeah. So. Um, as we finish up the interview, I want to ask you, do you have any advice for anyone who might want to get started in quilting? Um, if you can, one, don't take it. Don't, don't feel like you have to be perfect. Like, just don't just throw that out the window. One, enjoy what you're doing. This is your hobby. You want to have fun doing it. Don't put pressure on yourself. Um, completely, you know, completely just enjoy what you're doing. Put on music you like, put on a movie you like, and enjoy the process. Um, so don't stress about it too. I think if you're a very beginner quilter, taking a basic quilt class or a block of the month club or, um, and honestly, if you took mine, I'm going to walk you through exactly how to cut, how to, how to do everything. Um, so kind of get the structures of your techniques down, because that's going to carry you so much further than, you know, trying to focus on the pretty quilt and the fabric. Right. And you can buy a kit. I, I'm so a believer in kits for your first, for your first quilt, like buy a kit that you're in love with. And then that, and let it be easy. Like, even if it's, a, you know, a log cabin block, a log cabin is one of the best beginner quilt that looks complicated that can be that can be um laid out in variety of ways like it is such a versatile pattern um and it's all straight line like quilting is so much easier than sewing fat or sewing fashion or yeah. home deck. so if you have any home deck or fashion experience if you can thread a sewing machine quilting's easy yeah. it's easy and yet it's i fine. know people who say that who sew garments for years, they've never done quilting. They say, oh, I could never do quilting because it's just too precise. No. <laughs> so, you know, but I agree. Yeah, the kit, that's how I got started. My first quilt was from a kit and it took me through the basics and that's how I learned them. And then I started taking classes and mm -hmm. worked my way up from there. So, but there's always something, like we said earlier, there's always something new to learn too. So that's what keeps it Absolutely. exciting. Absolutely. I learned at a block of the month. So the quilt store that I learned from is you went once a month and they gave you a block. You paid $5. You got a block and it had just enough fabric to do that with the instructions. You went in and you sat in this little, it was really like a sales pitch because they showed you all the new stuff. Mm -hmm. they showed you how to make it. They said, you cut this, you do this, you sew this, you do this. And so they started with the easy kind of four patch type of stuff. And then they went to half square triangles. Then by the end, you're making quarter square triangles. And, you know, um, but every month I would go in and watch her. Okay, this is how you sew this together. And all I had to make was one block. And you learn how to make one block. And then, of course, it was a quilt store, so they're smart. So they were like, you can buy these fat quarters over here. Mm -hmm. and if you buy four of them, you can make a second block and it'll be Americana colors or batiks or thirties reproduction stuff. And you can make a second quilt because we've already given you the block instructions. 
for this first quilt. And so I would pick out a, you know, like I would do the 30s. And so I'd buy those every month. Well, now I'm buying stuff from them extra, which is what the point was. But I'm learning and I'm practicing. And you're just, I'm repeating that block. And I did it two or three times. And by the time I got to the end of the year, I'm like, I can do this kind yep. of thing. So yeah. just start, start beginning. And, you know, I've got a couple of classes online um, that'll do that, the stitch along, especially if you join it, I'll be happy to help because that's the point of the Zoom classes and stuff is for me to go, hey, all right, what got you stuck? What did you struggle with? How can we help? You know, and that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. So uh, just before we wind up here, do you have any um, last words, anything, final words you'd like to say that we haven't covered? <laughs> We've covered a lot. We've covered a lot. We did. We did. It's been so good. Um, have fun. Like, seriously, that's what this is. This is, this is a fun hobby. This is a fun, creative enjoyment. Don't, don't get all stressed out over it. Yeah, and don't get stressed. Yeah, exactly. No, yeah, like the, let's enjoy this. Let's enjoy this hobby. Let's enjoy this this time to be creative and to be um, just be inspired, being creative. And you know, I just that's my goal. It's like have to inspire other people's creativity. Yep, and I think if that's an admirable our creativity goal. in you, then I think I've succeeded. Yep, I think that's admirable. So thank you so much for doing this interview. And I will post below the interview when it goes up uh, the links that you're going to send to me. Don't forget to send those to me because I want them as much for myself as for everybody else too. And uh, okay. so I'm going to say goodbye. Just stay on the line though when I stop the recording. But once again, thank you, Lynn, so much. Uh, your YouTube channel is Cotton Arts Studio. So everybody check that out when you get a chance and everything. And we'll, I'm sure we are going to be talking again in the future as well. So thanks so much for your time.